please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Hi, welcome to Overdrive. You're watching the show with me, Soini Dat. Now, last month at the Auto Expo, Hyundai launched the Elite i20. It has got a midlife makeover, but it's now time to find out whether these cosmetic changes are good enough for it to rival with the rising competition. The Bellino might be the new king of hatchbacks at Suzuki, but you just can't ignore the Swift. It is still one of the biggest competitors in the premium hatchback space. And now with the all new third generation Swift making an entry into the Indian market, it was only natural that the other premium hatchbacks were going to respond. Now Honda has already prepared a facelifted Jazz which we saw at the Tokyo Motor Show last year. And Hyundai used the 2018 Auto Expo to launch the updated Elite i20. In fact, that is the car that we have with us here today. Take a closer look at what's changed. We got a chance to sample the 2018 Elite i20 in Mumbai in its new shade of orange and in the range topping Asta trim. The cosmetic changes are minimal but easy to notice. The three pot detailing on the tail lights has made way for a new pattern made up of horizontal lines. It is surprising that Hyundai did not make use of the more efficient LED lighting for it. They look good nevertheless and somehow remind me of the GLA tail lights. The reflectors and lamps placed in the rear bumper have been reprofiled too. At the front, the Elite i20 now wears the reshaped hexagonal grille and the complex mesh pattern adds a bit of flair to the familiar face. The bumpers integrate a new design for the fog lamp housing, one that carves out vertical crevices on the outer ends for better airflow and a marginal reduction in drag. The paint quality looks quite premium too and is on par with some of the more expensive cars in Hyundai's lineup. The Elite i20's new orange and red exterior colors can also be specified with a gloss black roof and that gets you a matching two-tone color scheme for the cabin elements as well. Speaking of the cabin, that receives a few nips and tucks too. The most important is the new touchscreen infotainment system, which now incorporates an IPS display that has lesser glare and is easier to read even from varied angles. The operating system now uses a grayscale theme for its icons and menus, replacing the blue theme that we saw on the outgoing model. The system is also compatible with Hyundai's new smartphone app that debuted with the Verna, and that lets you monitor your driving patterns, track service history and schedules, and also access certain vehicular functions like trip data. Hyundai has also thrown in an additional USB charging port that sits in line with the USB media port and the 12 volt socket in the center console. The cabin gets a black and beige combination by default and uses a darker shade of beige this time around for better endurance to dusty conditions. The upholstery is done up in matching shades too and has a new pattern compared to the outgoing car. There is no change on the seating arrangement or the contouring of the seats. They are quite comfortable but I still feel that the rear seat could have done with more recline. Choosing the range-stopping trim lets you secure the cabin with up to six airbags. Unlike the Grand i10, the Elite i20 is a more responsible car and gives you anti-lock brakes and the driver and front passenger airbags as a standard fit. The rear seats now come with Isofix style seat anchorage too. mechanical changes to the updated Elite i20, so you continue to get the trusty 1.2-litre petrol motor or the punchy 1.4-litre diesel that we all love so much. Now, the diesel engine can be had with a 6-speed manual transmission, the petrol can be spec with a 5-speed manual or a CVT automatic. The one that I'm driving right now is the petrol manual. To refresh your memory about the character of these engines, both work well for urban routines and highway runs. Driving around twisties will need you to keep the petrol engine on the boil, while the diesel is easier to have fun with with its healthy mid-range torque. Hyundai say that the design updates are not purely cosmetic, they also upgrade the functionality of the car. For example, those little air curtains like Hyundai likes to call them or those air dams that you see next to the fog lights, they have improved the overall aerodynamic efficiency of the front end and that has led to a 9% increase in fuel economy. I think it's going to be pretty marginal. It's not something that you will notice in your day-to-day -day use, but then it's a good addition to have. During our test on the manual petrol, we didn't find any noticeable difference in the fuel economy within the city environment. 
highway runs, however, revealed a marginal improvement over the outgoing Elite i20 of similar spec. I think what you'll continue to like with the Elite i20 is the light and convenient steering wheel, the supple ride, and of course, the engine options that we spoke of. So whether you're hitting the twisties, driving in the city, going for long drives on the highway, I think this remains quite a likeable car. The i20 has always been a hatchback that is brimming with features, but this time around, the updated model nicely distributes these features and safety technologies across various trim levels. So if you ask me, I think in the premium hatchback space, it still is one of the best buys. Now I want to select a segment here on the show where our overdrive editor will answer all of your queries. Shumi joins us as always. Hi Shumi, our first question this week comes in from Akash Menon. He writes in from Bangalore saying that he owns a 2016 model of the Hero Hunk and has covered uh, over 10,000 kilometers on that motorcycle. He wants to know whether he should use an ordinary oil or a semi-synthetic oil for this motorcycle. Also, he would like to know that uh, when is it advisable to start using fully synthetic uh, oil for this motorcycle? Akash, honestly, full confession, I've actually never paid attention to what oil goes into any of my motorcycles. Uh, whatever the manufacturer recommends, as long as the oil level is fine and you check the oil level often enough, change the oil filter where required often enough, I think you're good. As far as your hull goes, if it's already done 10,000 problem free kilometers, I don't see a problem that you really need to fix. Modern engines though, they're unhappily on semi-synth or synth, so you want to go full synthetic, absolutely go for it. Me. I wouldn't bother, I would just ride the motorcycle everywhere, put more petrol in it, put more miles on it, have more memories from it. Oil, not something I'd stop to really think about. Well, up next, Akshay Jain writes in saying that his daily commute is of 20 kilometers and around 200 to 250 kilometers over the weekends. He generally doesn't speed over 80 to 90 kilometers and he is planning to buy a Harley Davidson Street 750. Do you think that's a good idea, Shumi? Akshaya Street 750 is a good choice for a starter big motorcycle, absolutely no two ways about it. If you can extend your budget though, try and get the street rod. Uh, I think the street rod is a better overall package than the Street 750. Uh, however, if you've ridden both of the motorcycles and the Street 750 makes you feel better, absolutely go for the Street 750. I would tell you though, maybe on your cycle something more normal, like a normal naked like the Z650 or something might actually be a little bit easier to ride. So I would say before you go put down the money on your Street 750, go ride a Z650 once and get a sense of where your heart is. If it's a cruiser, cruiser, cruiser thing, Street 750. If it was just a big motorcycle that does a lot of nice things, the Z650 might be a little bit easier for you to ride every day. Well, Shumi, our final question this week comes in from Webhav Jain. He writes in saying that he wants to buy his first car and is confused whether he should go in for the Maruti Suzuki Swift or the Hyundai Elite i20, his priorities are low maintenance, good power, comfort and safety. What would you suggest to me? If you're going to buy a family hatchback uh, on your budget, you have the choice and it's an easy choice to make. Neither the i20 Elite nor the Swift are bad cars. Pick one, you'll be good. There is a subtle difference though. The i20 is considered a little bit higher than the Swift in terms of positioning. So you'll get a little bit more space, maybe a few more features. And if you just want a very, very effective family hatchback, maybe the i20 is the way to go. But if you like your driving, the Swift has always been the cornerstone of a family hatchback that knows how to handle corners. And that's the reason to buy the Swift. So whether you pick the Swift or i20, you can't really go wrong. If you just want an effective family hatchback, Hyundai. If you want to enjoy your driving up the mountain and all of that, Swift. We're always on the lookout for queries coming in from you. So you can send them to us on helpdesk at overdrive.co.in. You can also send them to us via Facebook or Twitter or on our YouTube comments section and we will answer them for you on the show. Right now though, it's time for us to take a quick look at the new commuter motorcycle from Bajaj and also the 125cc scooter from Aprilia. The Bajaj Avenger was the motorcycle that truly introduced masses in India to the concept of a cruiser motorcycle being affordable, small, light and nimble. Over the years, Bajaj has worked consistently improving the motorcycles to enhance the riding experience. And now, in its 2018 Avatar, we have a new Avenger 180. Well, the 180 is where the journey began for the Avenger, but Bajaj says that this time around there's a whole lot of changes and the bike is a lot nicer to ride. And that's something that we are trying to find out right now.
The engine on the new Avenger 180 is from the Pulsar 180 just like before. But this time around there's a lot more changes Bajaj says and it's in a slightly different state of tune apart from which Bajaj has worked extensively on making it a lot more refined. Priced at about Rs 85,000 X showroom, the Avenger 180 is an interesting motorcycle. It replaces the smaller Avenger 150, so now you have some more performance thanks to the higher displacement and the bike looks fresher thanks to all the visual changes for 2018. Considering how popular cruisers are with the masses, I think this motorcycle has a lot of potential to do well considering how popular the Avenger family is overall in India. There seems to be no real challenge for the Honda Activa and the market seems to be moving on to better things. As far as I'm concerned, since these are 125s that are a little bit faster, it's a better thing. The scooter under fire is the Suzuki Access which dominates and the latest challenger is the Aprilia SR125. Aprilia believes that while the response to the SR150 has been incredible, there is the opportunity to attract a slightly more youthful customer with a product placed slightly closer to his expectations of price and performance. That product is the new SR125. What Aprilia has done, in a sense, is scale down the SR150 engine to displace 125cc. The gearbox is the same and the body panels are identical too. But there is a longer seat and these new graphics. What that means is that the scooter looks sleek, stubby and modern all at once. But you do notice that compared to the SR150 and especially the race edition, the SR125 is a little more subtle. And it comes in silver and this dark blue, again two calm colors. But the rest of the package is almost the same. That means the best parts of the SR150 are still here. That would be the disc brakes, the V-rubber tires and yes, the 14-inch wheels. The 125 gets the 14-inch wheels from the SR150 and that makes a huge difference. These are the biggest wheels in the class and immediately it feels better around corners. Almost like a motorcycle really. However, I think they didn't retune the suspension from the SR150 to this and therefore this scooter is really really stiff to ride. To the point where on the average Indian road where there are bumps and lumps, you will be uncomfortable. What you will like though, and no surprise, is the engine. Like the SR150 and the Vespas come to think of it, the engine is happy to rev up to the max without any sense of undue strain. I saw well over an indicated 110 km an hour, while Anis, our photographer, who is much lighter than me, actually maxed the speedometer out 120 km an hour indicated. Then again, the 125 only loses half a horse and one newton meter of torque to the 150 while pushing the peak outputs a bit further up the revs. What it means is, the flow of thrust comes a little bit later when you open the throttle. What I do wish for is that Aprilia had given it the verve and vigor right off the bottom that makes riding the SR150 such a pleasure. On the SR150, when you open the throttle, the scooter shoots forward with intent. The SR150 feels quite a bit milder and that means you have to wait for the speed to come up before the engine asserts itself. That brings us to the price. The SR125 is priced at Rs 65,600 X showroom Mumbai approximately. That makes it about 3,000 rupees less than the SR150 and that gives me pause. The idea of a scaled down 150 is a good one, but I do think Aprilia had the chance to set up the 125 to be a little bit more compliant and they haven't. The ride quality as a result is jittery and anything other than smooth roads, you'll feel this. More importantly, the price difference to the 150 is so small that it makes me wonder who would take the 125 over the 150. The reason to buy the 125 over the 150 then would boil down to something like economy or a parent's comfort level with a 125cc scooter which is perceived to be less powerful than a 150cc scooter. I do honestly wonder how this will play out. And of course, before we sign off, allow me to remind you that Aprilia showed not one but two 125cc scooters at the 2018 Auto Expo in Delhi. The SR125 is here now and we wait for a road test unit to come to us. The SR Storm is to follow and it will be here before the year runs out, perhaps as early as Diwali. The new Royal Enfield
alphabet is brightly colored and wears one of the most mysterious alphabets of the English language as the suffix to its name. Meet the Royal Enfield Thunderbird 500X. So what's the Royal Enfield we've all been waiting for? Is it this one? I know you're going to talk about the 650 twins, right? But there is still some time before those motorcycles get here and the new Royal Enfield right now is that. That's the Thunderbird 500X, its little cousin, the 350X, also on sale. It's not here today, but we're going to find out what's under the skin. The story though, it's not complicated at all. That is a Thunderbird and what's changed? We'll find out now. The Thunderbird was launched as a cruiserish motorcycle with chrome pods for instruments, big bars and a saucy purple colour that I still remember. Many years later, the new 500 became a more focused touring model with a 500km tank and my personal highlight, a stiffer front end that allowed you to push the bike harder in the twisties. The new 500X is an aesthetic variant based on the Thunderbird. The engine and frame haven't been altered in any way, save for the factory-fitted alloy wheels. But the Thunderbird 500X aims to be a premium commuter, not a tourer. To achieve that goal, the 500X receives a new handlebar bend and a new seat design. So when you change a handlebar and a seat on a motorcycle, do you make a substantial difference? In the case of the Royal Enfield, there is definitely a change because the bar gives you more leverage, which means navigating city feels easier, you get more feedback from the front end, and at the same time, the grip your seat material locks you into place, and that's always a good thing on a motorcycle. Still not a fan of the way Royal Enfield does the dish seat though. In the city, not so much of a bother, but when that thing is the highway, I think most of us are going to have to find a way to make ourselves more comfortable. And the pillion seat, well, Let's say that you're not going to make too many friends if you carry them around pillion for long distances. But Royal Enfield understands only too well that not everything is about function and aesthetic appeal is a powerful force. So the styling department has made a few key changes that look great. The most obvious is colour selection. The contrast of a brightly coloured tank, you get them in orange, blue, white and red against an all-black motorcycle is simultaneously hipster modern and genuinely retro. Many Thunderbird bits stay on, but the classy looking and almost hidden cast alloy grab rails add neatness to the lines which the slimmer looking seat ties together nicely. And then there is, well, no, we're done. That's the story of this bike. Royal Enfield wants to be the world's largest seller of middleweight motorcycles, and it wants to do this by selling easy, accessible motorcycles. Well, as stories go, I don't think you can do easier and more accessible than this, because that, in effect, is a Thunderbird. What Royal Enfield has added are the alloy wheels, factory-fitted alloys, that's always a good idea, and you pay 8,000 rupees more than a stock Thunderbird for the privilege. Should you be spending that money? Well, there's two things you need to decide. First is the aesthetic. There's a brightly coloured tank and the rest of the motorcycle is black. Is that your favourite taste or would you rather prefer the old Thunderbirds looks? The second, of course, is the ergonomics package. Do you want a pullback bar or do you prefer these flatter bars? That's really the decision you're making. With that, it's a wrap on this week's episode of Overdrive. But remember, you can stay in touch with the team through Facebook as well as Twitter. We like to hear your feedback as well as comments. We would like to hear what you would like us to review next on the show as well. And if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel just yet, you must do that soon enough to check out our latest videos and all the updates. We'll see you next week. Until then, goodbye and many thanks for watching.